Hi, this is Dr. Jane Limmer. We're going to be talking about abortion. The learning objectives for this talk are as follows. To understand the difference between therapeutic and spontaneous abortion, to know the different types of spontaneous abortions, to review the risk factors for spontaneous abortion, to understand how should spontaneous abortions be managed and how therapeutic abortions are performed, and to know the possible complications of both types of abortion. The talk will proceed as follows. We will review the types, etiology, and management of spontaneous abortion, the types of induced abortion, and the complications of both. Spontaneous abortion is more commonly known as miscarriage. It is defined as pregnancy loss prior to 20 weeks gestation. Such pregnancy loss occurs far more frequently than most people think, and it is estimated that 50 to 70 percent of all pregnancies end in miscarriage. The majority of these losses occur before women even realize they are pregnant. Approximately 20% of clinically recognized pregnancies end in spontaneous abortion. It is estimated that 80% of spontaneous abortions occur in the first trimester of pregnancy prior to 12 weeks gestation. Spontaneous abortion is further categorized into subtypes based on whether the cervix is open or closed and whether or not the fetus is alive. Moreover, there are some fertilization events that will lead to growth of pregnancy tissue but never develop a fetal pole, known as anembryonic gestations or blighted ovums. These pregnancies also fall under the category of spontaneous abortion. If a woman experiences vaginal bleeding but has a live fetus or potentially viable early first trimester pregnancy, a speculum exam should be performed. If the cervix is closed, the patient is having a threatened abortion. If the cervix is open, the abortion is considered inevitable and the patient should be offered some type of intervention to complete the abortion. We will discuss this further later in the presentation. In comparison, if a patient experiences fetal demise, the type of spontaneous abortion depends on whether or not the fetal tissue remains in the uterus. If all fetal and placental tissue remains, the patient has a missed abortion. If some tissue has passed but still remains, the patient has an incomplete abortion. Finally, if the patient has had a fetal demise and has passed all the pregnancy tissue, the abortion is categorized as complete. Some patients will develop intrauterine or even systemic infections associated with a spontaneous abortion, often characterized by fevers and abdominal pain. These patients are described as having septic abortion. Finally, women who undergo three spontaneous abortions in a row with no intervening normal pregnancy are described as having recurrent abortions. These women should be worked up for causes of recurrent miscarriage. Although the etiology of many spontaneous abortions is never known, there are certain conditions that commonly end in pregnancy loss. These conditions may be specific to the fetus, or the mother, or the mother's environment. Certain conditions are more likely to cause pregnancy loss at certain gestational ages. For example, losses at less than 10 weeks gestation are usually related to a chromosomal anomaly in the fetus. In contrast, uterine anomalies and cervical insufficiency typically result in fetal loss in the mid-second trimester after 18 weeks. Within chromosomal anomalies specifically, which cause the majority of spontaneous pregnancy losses, autosomal trisomy, or three copies of a chromosome, is the most common abnormality. Trisomy 16 and trisomy 22 occur most frequently. It is postulated that single gene mutations may also be responsible for the loss of chromosomally normal pregnancies. Several maternal conditions place women at risk for pregnancy loss. First, structural anomalies in the uterus, both congenital and acquired, can create an inhospitable environment for fetal growth and development. For example, septate uterus is the most common uterine anomaly associated with spontaneous abortion. Other such anomalies include bicornuate uterus, uterine fibroids, and intracavitary synechiae, or scar tissue, from prior surgeries. Cervical insufficiency is painless cervical dilation leading to delivery of a non-viable fetus in the second trimester. In addition, there are multiple medical conditions such as hypothyroidism, and poorly controlled diabetes mellitus that may predispose a woman to spontaneous abortion. It is important to note that many women with these conditions carry successful pregnancies. 
Maternal thrombophilias, in which women have an increased tendency to form blood clots, such as antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, can lead to pregnancy loss, likely by damaging the placental vasculature. Moreover, certain infections in the cervix, uterus, and or semen have been associated with spontaneous abortion. These include chlamydia, gonorrhea, urea plasma, mycoplasma, staphylococcus, and streptococcus. In addition, maternal infection with listeria, toxoplasmosis, parvovirus B19, varicella, cytomegalovirus, rubella, and primary herpes simplex can cause pregnancy loss. There are also modifiable factors in the maternal environment that may lead to an increased risk of miscarriage. These include maternal tobacco and alcohol use and radiation exposure. Finally, some women are carriers of balanced translocations, such that they may have a normal number of chromosomes, but their offspring often will not. If a spontaneous abortion is not complete at the time of diagnosis, sometimes intervention is required. The need for active management of a pregnancy loss depends upon the presence or absence of heavy bleeding, the presence or absence of infection, the gestational age of the pregnancy, the patient's medical history, and the patient's wishes. In the setting of infection and or heavy vaginal bleeding with hemodynamic instability, surgical intervention to empty the uterus is always indicated. This can be accomplished with manual or surgical vacuum aspiration. Pregnancies at later than nine weeks gestation are more likely to require surgical intervention in order to complete the passage of all pregnancy tissue, simply because of the amount of tissue present. It is estimated that a missed or incomplete abortion will pass between 52 to 84 percent of the time with no intervention, depending on how long the patient waits for the tissue to pass. If a patient elects for medical management of pregnancy loss, most commonly mesoprostol, a prostaglandin E1 analog, is prescribed. This causes both cervical softening and dilation, as well as uterine contractions, to expel the pregnancy tissue. Women with pregnancies less than 12 weeks gestation can complete a spontaneous abortion at home using mesoprostol if they elect to do so. In contrast, medical management of a spontaneous abortion greater than 12 weeks should be performed under close monitoring in the hospital due to an increased risk of heavy bleeding. With all patients who undergo spontaneous abortion, it is crucial to check a blood type and administer Rogam if the mother is Rh negative in order to prevent isoimmunization in future pregnancies. In contrast to spontaneous abortion, induced abortion is the medical or surgical termination of a live pregnancy. Induced abortions are sometimes also referred to as therapeutic abortions when they are performed because of risk to a woman's health or lethal fetal anomalies. When asked why they are choosing to terminate a pregnancy, the most common response that women give is either responsibility to other family members or economic constraints. It is estimated that 50% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned, and 4 out of 10 of these pregnancies end in abortion. It is important that women who have an unplanned pregnancy are counseled on all possible options, which would include continuing the pregnancy, terminating the pregnancy, or giving the infant up for adoption. Methods for pregnancy termination are similar to those for managing a spontaneous abortion, though there are some key differences. Medication terminations can be performed up to 63 days or 9 weeks gestation, depending on the regimen that is used. Most commonly, these are performed with a combination of mifepristone, which is given first, and mesoprostol, which is taken at home 24 to 72 hours later. Mifepristone, a competitive progesterone receptor antagonist, interrupts the endometrial lining that is supporting a growing pregnancy and sensitizes the myometrium to prostaglandins, thereby making mesoprostol more effective. Pregnancies in the first trimester that are past nine weeks gestation are terminated by uterine evacuation, either manual or electrical uterine aspiration, or DNC. In the second trimester, pregnancy terminations are completed either by dilation and evacuation or labor induction. Dilation and evacuation, or D&E, is similar to D&C, except that the cervix is dilated further and forceps are used to extract fetal tissue rather than a suction cannula. Cervical dilation is often initiated the day prior to the procedure using laminaria. Laminaria are osmotic dilators that mechanically open the cervix as they absorb fluid and expand. 
Second and third trimester abortions can also be performed as labor inductions. Prior to DNE or labor induction, fetal demise can be caused by injections of intracardiac potassium chloride or intraamniotic versus intrafetal digoxin or by transection of the umbilical cord after membrane rupture. There are multiple options for carrying out abortion as a labor induction. First, the cervix can be dilated and ripened mechanically with a Foley catheter balloon placed through the cervix. Alternatively, mifepristone and mesoprostol can be used by the same mechanism as previously discussed. In addition, mesoprostol alone can be used, as can several prostaglandins, including gemiprost and dinoprostone. Ethocrine and lactate can be given as an intramuscular, extraamniotic, or intraamniotic injection. Urea can also be given as an intraamniotic injection. Finally, high-dose oxytocin can be given intravenously to cause uterine contractions. Intraamniotic injections are rarely used anymore in the United States. The potential complications of abortion are the same for both management of spontaneous abortion and induced abortion. These include bleeding that may require a blood transfusion, infection that may require antibiotics, perforation of the uterus that may lead to injury of other intra-abdominal organs, cervical laceration from either tearing of a tenaculum or excessively forceful dilation, retained products of conception that may require another procedure, and formation of intrauterine scar tissue that can cause infertility, otherwise known as Asherman syndrome. Acute hematometra is also known as post-abortal syndrome, in which women develop heavy cramping and an enlarged, tender uterus, but have minimal bleeding. It is treated by immediate uterine evacuation. The numbers listed on this slide for complication rates are for suction curatage abortions, according to Tillin's Operative Gynecology. Complications are more likely to occur at later gestational ages. It is important to note that induced abortion is very safe. Less than 0.3% of all patients who undergo abortion need to be hospitalized for a complication. If performed at less than 8 weeks gestation, the risk of death from induced abortion is less than 1 in 1 million whereas the risk of death is 1 in 29,000 at 16 to 20 weeks gestation. Risks are minimized when procedures are performed by experienced providers. It is also important to note that abortion is much safer than childbirth for women. Finally, multiple studies have demonstrated that induced abortion causes no harm to a woman's mental or emotional health and in fact may improve her emotional well-being by providing a sense of relief. In summary, abortion is a term that refers to loss of a pregnancy, whether spontaneous or induced. There are many types of spontaneous abortions, as well as multiple fetal and maternal conditions that increase the risk of spontaneous abortion. The options for managing a spontaneous abortion are similar to the options for induced abortion, and these vary depending on the gestational age of the pregnancy. The incidence of spontaneous abortion and induced abortion is high, and it is thus important to know how to care for these patients.